fastest forces in the Western Desert are now in full retreat. This episode is brought to you fortified by the highest quality tea experience, made with the military precision of tactical tea. The British Army has a long affiliation with tea, keeping the Tommy going. This is Guy Byam reporting from Normandy in 1944. There are signs up. Perhaps the most common is the phrase that always brings a smile to the faces of the troops. It's a phrase that would be quite incomprehensible to anyone but a Britisher. You see it everywhere. When in doubt, brew up. Well... When you brew up next, why not consider a nice cup of Blitz Brew from Tactical Tea? It's a traditional English breakfast tea, strong and robust, a throwback to the blends of the 1940s. Tactical Tea offer a wide variety of teas, white, black, fruit and herbal. So, to requisition your supply of Blitz Brew, go to tacticaltea.uk and use the code WW2PODCAST for 10% off your order. Tactical Tea, waging war on bad brews. Hello and welcome to another episode of the World War II Podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. Before the outbreak of war, the US Navy and the Marines had put considerable effort in developing a doctrine to support amphibious operations from ship to shore gunfire. When the Marines landed on Tarawa in November 43, it will be the first serious test of this doctrine. In this episode, I'm joined by Donald Michener to discuss the doctrine and how it developed from those initial assault landings on Tarawa through to the end of the war. Donald is a lecturer at the University of North Texas and author of US Naval Gunfire Support in the Pacific War. But before we get started, it's a big thank you to all those who have supported the podcast this last year by becoming patrons. A dollar or so from people like you, loyal listener, help me find the time to put the show together. You can find out more at patreon.com slash ww2podcast. I really do value your support and where possible, I do try to make available extra bits and bobs exclusive for patrons bit more World War II chat, as it were. So that's patreon.com slash ww2podcast. Donald, thanks for joining me. Let's um, clarify what we're talking about here. Um, well, how are we defining naval gunfire uh, support? Essentially, what uh, they were trying to, to determine was how to use uh, ship gunfire in place of the organic artillery that would normally support an offensive uh, in land warfare. And so basically that's what you're doing is that you're taking uh, ship guns and you're using them in place of uh, land artillery as far as World War II is concerned, 75 millimeter, 105 and 155 for the Americans. And so that's basically what the definition is. Now, the question is how to do that because there are some innate problems as far as the use of, of ships in place of land artillery. Land artillery can be much more precise because it's, you're staying in one place, you're rooted in one place, the gun itself is not moving around at all. And so it is easier to be precise with land artillery. Uh, ships, however, of course, they're floating on water. Even though they might be large ships, there's still a bit of movement that's involved. What they're going to have to do is to determine the best way, uh, the best techniques to use to provide the most accurate gunfire support that they can during the, the uh, early part of an amphibious assault. It's all that it occurred to me uh, when I was reading the book that, that obviously it's a ship's a moving platform. You just sort of think of them, well, they're hitting ships miles away anyway. It can't be that. How difficult can it be? But I guess a ship's a big t- <laughs> another ship's a big target compared to uh, something small on land. <laughs> yes. Uh, I mean, it's a dynamic system that is not rooted to the ground, but floating around on water. So, Yes, there's going to be in coming into the into the Second World War. How much had the U.S. Navy? How much thought did the U.S. Navy put into the sort of a, the doctrine of how this was how this all, would all work? The theory behind what they were doing is it is it all just based on their experiences from the well, possibly not their experiences, but the the experiences of the First World War. 
what, what it really grows out of as far as the Marine Corps is concerned is an attempt to find a mission for itself that wa- would be unique to itself. Because uh, whereas amphibious warfare has been known since ancient times, I mean, it's nothing, there's nothing really new about that. But uh, the Marine Corps, toward the end of the 19th century and entering the early 20th century, had uh, fought a number of battles with the Navy and uh, after World War I in particular with the Army for its very institutional existence. And so what one of the things that they wanted to do was to develop a mission that they could perform themselves that the other branches had not really put a lot of time and effort into. Uh, and so you see in the very early 20th century, the development of the idea of what was called the advanced base force. And that was in the uh, aftermath of the U.S. Spanish-American War. The United States was beginning to reach out into the Pacific in particular to establish itself in different areas, especially looking for coaling stations along the way going across the broad Pacific Ocean in order to be able to establish those uh, those culling stations, you would have to capture them and you would have to defend them. And so the advanced base force concept uh, grows out of that. As we go into the 1930s, the Marine Corps, uh, and this is in the aftermath of the uh, of Commandant John Lejeune uh, in the 1920s, looking for a, a mission that was even more specific, if you will, than the advanced base force. And what we uh, see is the uh, issuance on 7 December of 1933 of um, General Order 241 that established what was called the Fleet Marine Force. And the Fleet Marine Force, its specific job was to operate with the fleet, the the U.S. fleet, and in uh, landing operations and whatever other type of operations was. So that provided the basis for what would develop in the 1930s. They had a group of, of uh, Marines who could be trained to take part in landing operations, but they don't have a doctrine. Okay, where are you going to get a doctrine? That's when they started writing the doctrine in the early 1930s. The Marine Corps schools took it upon itself to develop the doctrine. There were some naval officers who were involved in this as well, but the principal impetus was provided by the Marine Corps. And the Marine Corps schools, they divided the the students and the faculty up into groups that would look at different parts of the doctrine. Their their job was to write up doctrine. Then they put it all together in a, uh, in a, a manual. Now, the first manual and my students, I, I love to use this with my students because it <laughs> shows who's paying attention and who isn't. The first manual that came out of that in 1934 was the tentative manual for landing operations. Okay. The next year on 9 July, 1935, after they had, had uh, continued to develop it, they issued the tentative landing operations manual, 1935. That is the basis, that is the foundation for what would become the U.S. amphibious warfare doctrine going into World War II. And it will become that whenever the Navy takes it in. It was issued for both the Marine Corps and for the Navy. But the Navy will take it in uh, and and in doing so will transform the look of it. The terminology will become more naval as opposed to and all that. But ultimately, what will come out of that will be Landing Operations Doctrine, U.S. Navy, 1938. That's also known as Fleet Training Publication, FTP-167. And that is essentially the doctrinal Bible, if you will, uh, for the U.S. sea services for amphibious warfare going into World War II. Okay, so the, the doctrinal writing occurs during the 1930s. Essentially, long answer to your <laughs> Question. It's fascinating that they sit down and actually pull that together and go, look, what is your group? What is our group thinking? And they actually come up with a piece of, you know, this is what we think. It's not as if it's lots of different arms doing different things. It's it's actually, I mean, it's perhaps the American Army works like that, but it strikes me as actually a surprisingly uh, coherent way of doing things where, where the whole service can come up with an agreed text that they can move 
forward with. At one point, they shut down the Marine Corps schools so that they could finish writing up uh, the doctrine. So they didn't even hold classes. Uh, for a period of time so they could get it done. That's, I mean, it, it just shows you how important the Navy feel, felt it was to, you know, because they, they could have easily become uh, like partisan over it um, <laughs> and, 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 you know, just told the Marines, this is what you're getting, as opposed right. to... Uh... <laughs> yeah, they, they actually did work together. Now, uh, as to who was more important in the development of the doctrine, there are differing opinions amongst naval officers and uh, Marine uh, Marine Corps officers and the like. But uh, once it becomes FTP-167, there is equal input, if not more, by the Navy than there is uh, with the Marine Corps because it becomes a Navy publication at that point and becomes Navy doctrine at that point. They didn't leave it there, however, because with the publication in, in 38 of FTP-167, well, they're going to work with it. At that point, okay, you got the doctrine. Now you've got to test it. And so in a number of, of uh, fleet landing exercises in the late 1930s and into the early 1940s, they tested various aspects of the doctrine. And so as a result, on 2 May of 1941, they issued what's known as Change 1, FDP 167. Now, Change 1 is a complete change, okay, a complete change. You, they told them to take FTP-167, uh, 1938, throw it away, and take this completely redone uh, document and stick it in the folder now. That's now FTP-167. Then after some more testing with Change 1, uh, on 1 August of 42, they introduced Change 2. Now, there were only a few changes in that, that based upon the, the fleet landing exercises during the early 1940s. But after Guadalcanal, there is the final change that is uh, made to FTP-167 itself, change three. That was issued 1 August 1943. Now, the main change of, uh, in, in change three concerns the chapter on naval gunfire support. There is a big difference between the chapter uh, after change three and the chapter prior. I mean, it truly is a Navy document with change three. Everything is, it, everything is explained using Navy terminology because the gunners, for one thing, are going to be Naval gunners, you know, trained by the Navy. The gunnery officers overseeing the, the gunnery of the ships, they're going to be Naval officers. So everything has to be in the language that they understand, for one thing. But, but also, they're going to test it. Even further, but after change three, the real testing now is the war. What happens with the different uh, in the different operations and how things come out. So, if change three is a big change from change two, and there's Guadalcanal in between, had they had they learned something at Guadalcanal that made them rethink and make the big change on uh, naval support gunfire? Is there something there, or are they, are they learning from somewhere else? Not any really big changes, because for one thing, at Guadalcanal, they did, it was not an amphibious assault. It's just an amphibious landing, really, more than anything else. It wasn't an amphibious assault. They did learn some lessons concerning counter-battery fire and also call fire in support of uh, the Marines ashore once they had, had landed. The, the Army would organize artillery into batteries. So how does the Navy do that? Because I guess you could just bring in more ships, but then your ships have got different caliber guns. They must do different things with different characteristics at different ranges. How are the Navy practically organizing um, shore battery ships? Shore? When they make up the uh, Naval Gunfire Support uh, groups, they take into account the, the guns aboard the different ships. They also take into account the number of gun directors aboard the ships because a destroyer, for instance, it, it can only act as one battery, if you will. Okay, it has one director. Heavy cruisers and battleships have more than one, and so they can actually divide up somewhat to be used, though, of course, <laughs> the areas that they are going to uh, support can't be far apart from one another. They have to be fairly close. But it's in the planning stages uh, that you make those decisions about what ships are close in, what ships are farther out, uh, what uh, uh, guns they carry, what caliber guns, and also looking at the 
intelligence information that they have about the defenses on shore, you know, that's going to, to be very important in deciding what ships would be placed in what areas and the like. So it's, it's a very, uh, the planning process is very, very important in this regard. And the naval officers who plan take into account the various ships and what they're capable of doing putting them where, where they can best be used. It, it, it's much more complex than you first would have thought. You just thought you'd just pull the ships off, off offshore and just fire them in. And another thing that occurred to me, because I've actually been thinking about the uh, uh, naval treaties into war, was actually the uh, elevations of guns. Because you know, artillery can actually have quite high elevations, so it doesn't have to be that far away, where, where ships could be designed for firing miles away, which if you're having to be a long way offshore to fire, it... it affects what you can see. I'd say probably the only naval uh, gun mount that would be capable of providing high angle uh, fire would be the dual purpose five inch mounts that they had because they could get a pretty high angle. But uh, pretty much everything else, uh, yes, you're going to be uh, limited as far as the, the angle of fire. In order to get more of an angle of fire, you have to go farther away but then that your accuracy is going to be affected uh, by that. And so what they would do is that they would, uh, especially with atolls, you're able to move around the islands fairly easily. You can get better view of, of the enemy. Uh, the defilated uh, positions, you can go around and catch them, catch them from the back. However, when you get to Saipan and Guam and the larger islands, uh, you've got a problem with that. And, one of the things that they started doing was using uh, less uh, gunpowder, you know, le- less of a load so that there's not as much muzzle velocity. Because the higher the muzzle velocity, the flatter the trajectory. Okay, so you decrease the amount of powder that you're using so that you can waft it a little more. And it, it helps some. Now, does it solve the problem? No, not really. So even in the best of conditions, if you've got a lot of hills in back of the landing beach, there are going to be places on these larger islands that you're, it's going to be very difficult, if not impossible, to reach. And so the idea there is that, unfortunately, there's going to be a certain number of guns that we're not going to be able to knock out. Uh, we'll knock out everything we can, if we can, but uh, it's going to, uh, to be the organic artillery and get it ashore as quickly as possible that would uh, be a better able to take those guns out. Oh, and another thing that you can do is airplanes, you know, dropping uh, bombs on those areas. Aircraft support of the uh, landing operations is very, very important. It, it's one of the major components of the amphibious operation doctrine is uh, aircraft support. Uh, and so airplanes and uh, ships, uh, gunfire work together in, in, in trying to take out those type of positions. Are, are they having to reinvent the wheel with uh, ammunition? Because presumably land-based artillery is firing different ammunition than naval, regular naval ammunition. And then you've got a problem with logistics. The ships have to carry twice as much. They have to carry ship-to-ship ammunition and ship-to-shore ammunition. Yes, and the, according to the doctrine going into the war, the idea was that all ships that were involved in uh, naval gunfire support had to keep 50% of, of their ammunition in armor-piercing and high capacity in case of a fleet engagement. Because if say, you know, the Japanese. If the Japanese attack using surface ships, then the naval gunfire ships will have to help to defeat that fleet and repulse that attack and then come back and and continue their uh, naval gunfire support mission. As we get into the uh, Central Pacific campaign at Tarawa, that's going to be a very important point that comes out of it is that the Japanese, with the exception of a a uh, submarine that uh, sank the USS Liscombe Bay off of, of Macon Island, that they did not have to protect themselves against a fleet action. And in Operation Flintlock, uh, Kwajalein Atoll, they didn't have to protect themselves against a fleet action. Now, you get to Saipan, and there is an attempt by the Japanese to attack, though not a fleet action in the sense of surface ships uh, fighting one another. It's aircraft carriers trying to come in with airplanes. But nonetheless, they figure out that after a while that the Japanese are not going to be able to attack using their fleet elements. And so they 
increase incrementally the percentage of uh, land bombardment ammunition as opposed to armor-piercing and high-capacity rounds for fleet action as time goes on. But you're right, pointing out that, as with ships, there is a limited amount of ammunition. And with the smaller calibers of, of, of guns, the 20-millimeter uh, of 40, the uh, five-inch guns, they can resupply at sea fairly easily. But all the way up till the end, they're still trying to figure out the best way, uh, if at all, if they can do it at all, of resupplying the large caliber ammunition, 14, uh, 16 inch in particular. And they, they never really are able to do that effectively until about the time of Okinawa, they're figuring it out. But uh, not until then. And it's... As we've said before, we started, it's not like a channel crossing where you're just bringing the shells across the channel. You've got to drag them halfway across the Pacific to re- get a long yes. supply line. And, and, and you have to sh- uh, shift them or take them from one ship to another in the open ocean, rolling like this. And, uh, I mean, yeah, they're not as dangerous as they'll be once you fire them. But nonetheless, you can have an accident that could really wreck your day. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't want to be dropping them. No, no, no. Now, you mentioned Tarawa. So does Tarawa sort of, uh, as as an amphibious operation, does it uh, hold up the doctrine as a shining light of brilliance after all this forethought? Well, Um, um, in the aftermath, there are going to be a lot of after-action reports listing, and this is not unusual, listing all sorts of lessons learned. And one of the areas where a lot of lessons are learned is naval gunfire Uh, support. Now, going into the operation, the idea was that they were going to undertake a fire for destruction. And in the book, uh, I go into the misapprehension of terminology concerning neutralization versus destruction. Okay, I can say that going into Tarawa, the idea was that they were going to undertake fire for destruction, at least at first. And they do try. They start out like that. But very quickly, they, they find that these shells are knocking stuff up into the air, and now all of a sudden you can't really see anything. And in order for you to fire for destruction, you have to, to precisely place the shells on target, and you have to be able to see where they're landing. You can't see where they're landing. And so it, it very quickly devolves, if you will, uh, from fire for destruction to area fire. And the idea essentially is, and this is what the Navy was hoping for, is that we're going to saturate the place so well that the Japanese will have to be destroyed, that uh, that nothing can live through all of this. And what the Marines are going to find is that, well, the Japanese did live through that. And some of their uh, their bunkers that they they used, concrete, yes, but they also used um, palm trees to good effect. And uh, and what I mean by good effect is that and many, many years ago, before this, uh, in the American Revolution, it was found also that uh, the palm tree, whenever you, there, it's a mushy, soft wood, and so it absorbs the concussion very well. And so it, it, it acts as, a, um, as an insulator, if you will. And, and so their, their bomb proofs stood up to the American... Uh, bombardment a lot better than the Americans were expecting them to. But in the aftermath, Harry Hill, who was the commander of the naval, the Southern uh, force that attacked at at Tarawa, he had a long list of naval gunfire lessons. And that long list that he generated is what is referred to when you're talking about the lessons of Tarawa, okay, uh, as far as naval gunfire is concerned. And so the, these lessons, amongst them, uh, were come in close, as close as you can get, place fire on these uh, positions as precisely as possible, use as high a caliber of weapon as possible against known bomb-proof positions. And if at all possible, it would be good to hit these positions with a few armor-piercing 16 or 14-inch shells coming in at a high angle. Now, whether or not it would be possible to take these ideas and put them into practice, well, in the aftermath of Tarawa, another thing that he suggested was to build uh, defensive positions similar to what they found on Tarawa uh, back in the States or at Calabria in the uh, 
in the Caribbean was where they did most of this to build them there and then practice them, you know, figure out the best way to destroy them. So coming out of Tarawa, they, uh, that was, uh, those were some of the things that they found. Because the, the, the other interesting, it, it, it's Admiral Kelly. He, he is the commander for most of these, if not all of the big amphibious operations, isn't he? Yeah, Richmond Kelly Turner. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. an uh, amazing consistency uh, in, in many respects. You understand what it was, have the same man running the show for, for all of them. Um, is, is he aware of the uh, deficiencies at Tarawa? Is he, is he moving forward all the time, changing things, tweaking what's going on? He's aware of them. Interestingly enough, going into Operation Flintlock that followed up uh, the, the invasion of Tarawa, he is going to make a statement uh, which he says that the lessons of Tarawa were, were um, exaggerated to an extent. And that it uh, caused a a lot of officers, a lot of time wasted trying to figure out ways to get around what he considered to be uh, exaggerated defenses or whatever. That's a very uh, interesting position to take. Uh, A little bit about uh, Turner. And uh, in the book, you you read about Richard Connolly and his action in the Pacific. He had been in the Mediterranean before this. As a matter of fact, he was a very important American commander uh, in Husky, at uh, Sicily, and the like. And so he was specifically sent out from the Mediterranean to the Pacific to carry some of the lessons that they had learned in the Mediterranean out to Turner and the others in the Pacific. Turner was not one to want to learn lessons from other people, especially people he did not consider his, his equal. And, and that's why I treat Connolly different. Uh, different from differently from the others, in that Connolly had a background that is going to inform his planning and inform his putting the doctrine into practice that Turner and the others did not have because he came from a different theater and had a different view. And it's my argument that of all of them, Connolly is the one who seems to demonstrate ultimately uh, having learned the most important lessons concerning uh, naval gunfire. And, of course, he had help here at Guam. He was supposed to go into Guam three days after they went into Saipan. But because of what was happening on Saipan itself with uh, them running into more opposition, uh, greater opposition than they had had planned on meeting, and uh, also with the Japanese attacking the Battle of the Philippine Sea and all that, they had to put off the invasion of Guam. Like I said, it was supposed to be three days after, 15 June. It was supposed to take place three days later on the 18th June, but they had to postpone it because of the problems that were having on Saipan. So that meant ultimately that he was going to have 13 days uh, for a preliminary bombardment rather than three days or you know four days. He had 13 days, and he used those 13 days to great effect, as it turns out. Is it Guam where he was ordered not to alienate the population, the local population? Yes. You know, how do you subdue an island without alienating the, the local population when you're essentially lobbing heavy explosives onto the island? Well, uh, I'm sure that he tried his best, but ultimately the mission to support the landing is going to be paramount. Uh, and I believe that the the uh, native population there, Guam, we had a good relationship with those people. The Japanese had done nothing to uh, to win their <laughs> win them over to them, and so I, I don't think that it was as much of a problem as they feared that it would be. They just wanted to make sure that they wouldn't create a problem if one did not exist. Yeah. So what's Con- Connolly doing differently? What, you know, what's he wanting to do differently when he's when he's allowed to? Well, is spreading it out over a period of time, not rushing, and that's one of the. The lessons of Tarawa was that they knew that they had only a certain amount of time in which to uh, fire a certain tonnage of, of shells onto the, the target. Whenever they begin to knock the dust up in the air, now all of a sudden they can't see anything. And it, they have this an even greater impetus to get it done quickly and, and just fire massive quantities as quickly as possible. Connolly understood that that is not going to help. It actually can be detrimental to the overall uh, mission that they're trying to complete here. And so with the 13 days, he slows everything down. He makes sure that there isn't a lot of dust in the air. 
whenever he's trying to undertake precise hits on known uh, Japanese defensive positions. And he just he takes his time. And another thing that that he uh, figures out is that and at at, uh, Tarawa, they begin to understand this, that the, the doctrine going into the war, they were very worried that aircraft and naval gunfire could not operate together because if the airplanes came in too low, that the shells might hit them. Okay. Well, they found out that really that that never happened. Uh, it and, and it wasn't likely to happen. But what Connolly will figure out is that there is a point beyond which the, the shells will not go, and it's lower down than they were expecting it to be. The aircraft can come in lower down and more accurately place their bombs on target, and both of them can work together. We see this especially uh, at Tinian. Now, as I explained, I don't cover Tinian in the book because the use of 155-millimeter uh, land artillery in firing on Tinian from Saipan, it became a very important element in softening up Tinian that throws off uh, the, the analysis. Okay, it, it, it messes up the analysis as far as naval gunfire is concerned because I'm specifically looking at naval gunfire. And so uh, I did present a paper later on and, and have a paper and have a paper concerning tinium, but it's not included in the book for that for that reason. But Connolly is is not over the uh, the attack on tinium, but he is over the attack on Guam, and he puts together a plan that allows for simultaneous attacks by aircraft and by uh, naval gunfire, so that he can get the maximum out. Uh, the biggest bang for the buck, if you will, in the time that he has. Is it recognised how well he does? Yes. Yes. He, uh, Are people started to imitate what he's doing? He's not really going to be used after Guam that much. I mean, at Okinawa, he, he shows up again, but he's not as important a commander after that. And some argue that it could be that uh, Kelly Turner didn't like the competition and uh, how it would look against him. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what some people say. <laughs> yeah. Well, the thought I had about commanders, it's the fifth and the third fleet's the same fleet, but you change out, is it um, Spronance is in charge, it's the fifth fleet, and Halsey in charge, it's the third fleet. I wonder if those commanders at the top and their immediate subordinates, which would change in and out, do they have... Did they bring a different approach, or did they just leave Kelly to it? Because he's, he's he is the consistent factor. It, it is interesting. For instance, Stalemate Two, Peleliu. Uh, it was Third Fleet that oversaw that, so it was Halsey in overall command, and there were were different uh, commanders uh, in charge as opposed to Fifth Fleet. And for instance, Richmond Kelly Turner was not involved uh, at Peleliu. But uh, it, it's interesting how much of a difference it made, not so much with the naval commanders, the difference in, in the naval commanders, but the difference in the Marine Division that was involved. It was the 1st Marine Division. The 1st Marine Division up until that time had not undertaken a, an all-out hardcore uh, amphibious assault up until that time, like the 2nd, 3rd, 4th Divisions uh, had in the 5th Division whenever it's involved in Iwo Jima. And so one of the things that they did not have that other Marine divisions had learned was necessary was a, a, a Marine Corps officer whose specific job was to uh, act as a liaison between the Marine Corps units who were going ashore and the naval gunfire units, the, the overall naval gunfire uh, officers who would oversee that. And a, as a result, there wasn't as close a planning between the two uh, at uh, at Peleliu than was true before that. And so as a result at Peleliu, it's, it's argued, and I agree with it, that there was not as efficient and effective use of, uh, of the naval gunfire support. Jesse Oldendorf, and this is what's very interesting, is that Jesse Oldendorf was the person who directly oversaw naval gun, uh, gunfire support uh, at Peleliu uh, up until D-Day. What's interesting about it is, is that Oldendorf had been involved in the other oper- in other operations under Turner. So it's not like he's an, an absolute neophyte who's never been involved with all this. But at Peleliu, he reaches the point where he says he ran out of targets 
that he didn't have any more targets left. And so they essentially ended up with a whole lot of ammunition that they did not use in the preliminary bombardment. The problem with that is that doctrine itself says if you don't have specific targets, then you are then to use your ammunition for area bombardment in areas where it is most likely that the enemy will be located. They didn't, they didn't do that. Now, uh, Oldendorf is going to say later on that uh, people on his staff were sick, uh, that he wasn't feeling the best uh, either. That may have been true. I mean, I'm not saying that it wasn't true. I don't know if it was true or not. But the job was so important that if, if they were having problems in that regard, then should have gotten a little more help, you know, uh, because the, the 1st Marine Division is going to pay a price uh, as a result. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's an odd one to claim that you've run out of targets. You know, it was it struck me as, really? <laughs> Send a plane over, find some more, check the ones you've hit, maybe hit them again. <laughs> yes, and it is true that uh, at Peleliu, by that time, the Japanese, their doctrine had changed, and they were be- like, uh, you yeah. see it, Biak over... Well, that was going to be my next question. Yeah. Everybody's learning. So what are the Japanese learning in reverse? <laughs> well, for one thing that they're learning is, is that it's practically impossible and they will eventually figure out that it's impossible to stop the Americans at the beach. You just can't. Okay. And so what you're going to have to do is to put in place a, uh, a defense in depth so that whenever the Americans do land and you're going to try to attract the Americans as much as possible up to that point, but once they do land, you need to have enough of a defense left to continue fighting against them once they get ashore because you're not going to stop them right right at the shore. At Iwo Jima, Kiribayashi, he is going to come to the conclusion that I can't stop them at the shore, so I'm not going to try. And that was his original thought. It's a couple of his subordinate officers who have a problem with that, and they're going to argue for something to be put on the shore. We can't just let the Americans come ashore. And so one of the things that I argue in the book is that, well, Kiribati put some stuff there on the shore, okay, right there at the, at the beach. And what this does, though he did not mean for it to happen, is that when the Americans get to their last precious day of naval gunfire support, and I go into the argument between the Navy and the Marine Corps over how many days, okay, it goes back and forth and back and forth. And finally, three days is what they're going to get. The very last day, They're going to end up following doctrine in the sense of using that last day to hit the stuff that's on the beach when the stuff that's on the beach is, as far as Kiribati is concerned, immaterial. It's there, but I've placed it there because I'm trying to placate uh, some of my subordinates. The real defense is inland, you know, actually buried in the island itself. Now, the question is, would naval gunfire have really been able to do anything beyond what it did to prepare uh, for the the invasion, uh, I would argue that there wasn't a whole lot more that it could have done, but at, if they had, had actually used the, the ammunition to hit those areas off the beach that they possibly could have found, because they were beginning to blow the camouflage off, they were beginning to find some more stuff, it would have been more useful to the Marines than what wasting it there on the landing beach. But that, you know, that's, in in the midst of a battle, I'm not one of those who tries to second guess people who are in the, uh, you know, in the trenches, if you will. You know, they did the best that they could. But as looking back, hindsight being what it is, we can see that they were led astray. My big surprise at Iwo Jima is how much they were surprised by things at Iwo Jima. And you think you, you, you can't believe that they didn't know about the volcanic beaches in the ridge. And why is they not had some planes over noticing that things are out where they shouldn't be? And it, it's those that that's what struck struck me about Iwo Jima. The surprises the Americans seem to have when they ha- are so dominant. Mm-hmm. And one of the biggest surprises was the nature of the sand. You can see this. This is sand from Iwo Jima. Okay. Notice that as I turn it, it just rolls. It rolls. It rolls. It doesn't clump. And that's it's that's the way it was. It, it, whenever you dug out, it just fell right back in. You, you couldn't dig any kind of a foxhole. It just it'd fill itself back in as quickly as you could dig it out. Uh, but, of course, the ribbon of land right there on the beach is so narrow. And this, this is something that Kiribati planned for. 
trying to get the as many Marines onto that thin ribbon of beach as possible, and then hit them with uh, from defilated mortars and other guns coming down and hitting them on the beach once they were crowded and couldn't move very well. He did mean to do that. And one thing I, I point out in the book also is that the Americans knew that Iwo Jima was going to be a tough nut to crack. I mean, they had uh, intelligence showing that the Japanese were building up their defenses on there, but exactly to what extent and exactly what they were doing, because they did notice that, wait, the Japanese are disappearing. Where are they going? <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, and so un, underneath. And let me point out that digging down into Iwo Jima and, and existing in those those caves and catacombs and everything was not a comfortable thing because remember there is a, a, a volcano that is involved here it's, it's hot whenever you get down there so it wasn't like they were in air-conditioned comfort uh in those uh in those in those caves and, and those catacombs that they they or those tunnels that they had made but uh the the americans knew that it was going to be difficult but exactly how difficult yeah they they were surprised in, in speaking with um, H.P. Wilmot a number of years ago, and then if you, you read some of his his works, he, he makes a comment about how the Americans got all upset about losing a few hundred or a few thousand as opposed to the numbers of people who were dying on the, you know, in Europe. Americans do not react well to large numbers of casualties. You know, what to European powers might be considered, though, though not happy to have to suffer them, understandable given the situation, whatever that situation might be in in the war, for there to be about 6,000 Marines killed on uh, Iwo Jima, that was a very difficult thing for the American public to take. They weren't used to losing that many Marines, especially in one operation. And going back to uh, Tarawa, losing just short of 1,000 they they weren't expecting to lose that many people, you know, in one operation. So uh, the Americans were more sensitive to such losses, <laughs> and, and and so it, it's it, it, and and we did have to take public opinion into account. Uh, you want the public to uh, stay behind you. You want the people to stay behind you in fighting the war, and so you had to be careful how you uh, how you reported that to to the American people. I wonder if, if sort of, uh, you know, we're getting before the bomb gets dropped. Had the U.S. Navy fundamentally rethought its doctrine, doctrine on uh, naval support gunfire, or were they still kind of with that uh, 1943 uh, third revision thinking? Well, is there an arc that they're following? Turner is uh, famous for saying that the, the doctrine never changed uh, during the war. And that's one of the things that I'm trying to show is that it never fundamentally changed. Granting that, I mean, from the very beginning, the idea is that you can take uh, heavily defended positions from the sea. Okay, that never changed. That you can use uh, naval guns in support of amphibious assaults in place of land artillery. That is true. But there were certain changes that did occur. In the doctrine, for instance, the idea that neutralization is not the point that uh, d- destructive fire is what we need to go for. And that's that's a bit of a change in doctrine. But there were a number of modifications in doctrine that even Nimitz and his command recognized. You look in 1944, uh, 1 May of 1944, and the Pacific Fleet issued is called um, – Uh, Pacific Fleet Confidential Letter 13 CL44. That was a modification of the naval gunfire doctrine. It was not written back into FTP 167 during the war, and hence the reason why I say that whenever Turner is thinking about no rewrite of the doctrine, he's probably thinking, well, we never issued another FTP 167. But nonetheless, beginning with 1 May 1944, as far as naval gunfire doctrine is concerned, you're looking at Pack Fleet Confidential Letter 13 CL 44, okay? And then later, after the Marianas, oh, by the way, that was issued in the aftermath of uh, Tarawa and uh, Kwajalein. In the aftermath of the Marianas and Iwo Jima, they issue, or Nimitz issues, Pack Fleet Confidential Letter 38 CL 45. 
and that's on the uh, 22nd of July of 1945. That is another additional additional modification of doctrine based on what they uh, the experience they had in the Marianas and at uh, Iwo Jima. So they they are modifying the doctrine as they go along, and as I point out, as far as as doctrine is concerned and changes in doctrine. Doctrine is used, as far as the U.S. Navy and their issuance of it, is used in training so that everybody learns the basic ideas. Everybody's on the same page. And so you train using the doctrine, and then you apply the doctrine as best you can, but doctrine should never be dogmatic. You know, it's not dogma. And so changes in technique. You can make some small changes in technique that are not going to uh, affect the doctrine as taught to uh, the people you're training. But then when techniques change so much or when ideas or experience shows that you must make a change in how you train people, then you have to make a change in the doctrine because then the doctrine has to change so that you're training people properly at that point. The Navy had a real problem with recognizing uh, in the early 20th century, late late 19th, early 20th century, the, the fact that Doctrine Act actually existed in the U.S. Navy. There were those who argued that it did not. I say that to indicate that in the early 20th century, there were naval officers in the United States who their understanding of doctrine wasn't necessarily the most accurate understanding of what doctrine actually is. So those are the two changes in doctrine, mod- modifications. Let's use that word, modifications in doctrine that were introduced by the Pacific Fleet in 1944 and 1945. And eventually that last change is going to be written into the, uh, well, there, there were a number of amphibious warfare publications that were issued by the U.S. Marine Corps in the immediate aftermath of World War II. And one of them was amphibious operations, naval gunfire support called FIB-11. Well, FIB, in FIB-11, they write into doctrine then the changes, modifications that uh, were implemented in uh, 44 and 45 by the Pacific Fleet. Okay. So eventually it gets written into. Uh, so it, they must have believed, they must have stuck with that enough to, to think, I mean, they've written that in July 45. That would be the thinking that they would have, if, if they'd have had to invade the, uh, the Japanese mainland, that would be the one that presumably they'd have, they believe was just their the most bang up to date thinking. If they've carried on rewriting that after the same, Second World War in the same manner. Now, now one thing with uh, as far as the invasion of the Japanese home islands are concerned, uh, both Kyushu and Honshu are large enough islands where, once you get the troops ashore, it's going to become a land campaign. You know, I mean, it's it's they're islands, but they're large islands, so it's going to become a land campaign. Hence, the reason why MacArthur was given overall command of uh, the invasion of, of Japan as opposed to a naval, well, Nimitz or, you know, some other naval officer. And so they were going to face a number of issues going into the, uh, the home islands of Japan that they'd never had to face before and how they would have, uh, have overcome them. I can't really say because they never actually had to, uh, had, had to deal with them. Suicide boats, uh, large scale kamikaze attacks, which, we saw off of Okinawa, the, the U.S. Navy lost more men off of Okinawa uh, than any, at any other time in any other operation in the war. We were just beginning to develop techniques for, hand, not handling, but uh, addressing <laughs> the kamikaze problem. And so how that would have come off, I can't say, uh, because the Japanese, I'm sure, would have thrown everything that they could. Uh, and it, it would have been, I'm, I'm glad it, it didn't have to come off. The, the one thing about the kamikaze problem, it would would have been it's finite. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they yes, only yeah. had so many planes to put right. people in. <laughs> yes, un, un, until they ran out of them, it would have been <laughs> it would have been really bad. And the suicide boats um, that could have uh, wreaked havoc uh, with the ship to shore movement uh, if they weren't brought under control very quickly. Yeah, if if uh, you're dealing with an enemy that is willing to do whatever it takes to get at you, 
then uh, they can do a, a lot of damage before you're able to get them under control. So, yes. Fascinating stuff. Well, I think that's all I uh, had, Keith. One I... thing that I wanted to do before we yeah, go left, um, I promised my, my publisher that I would mention uh, Breakor Academic. That's uh, the, the um, entity that oversaw the, the editing and publishing of, of the work, and I have them to thank for bringing this book that uh, m- most publishers would view as something so esoteric that they really wouldn't want to want to touch it. So Breakaway Academic is very important in that regard, and you wouldn't have this study if it weren't for them. Well, as I say, I think it's very worthy. It's worth people picking up a, a, for a flick through. It's uh, it's uh, really interesting niche of the war that you know you shine a light on that uh i think most people would be intrigued by well Um, one and one thing i wanted to make sure of was that though of course my analysis is in there i also wanted to provide people with as as full a coverage of the important documents as possible hmm. because these documents you don't find them in collections the way you you find some other uh, important documents and and so I wanted to provide that for people who were interested in, in studying the Pacific War a little more close, closely. Then. Well, that's good, because if you're not familiar with parts of the naval campaign when you start the book, you you won't get lost. D- Donald, thank, thank you for joining me. Loyal listener, if you want to know how the U.S. Navy supported the Marines as they made the amphibious assault landings in the Pacific and how that doctrine was developed, the book to read is... U.S. Naval Gunfire Support in the Pacific War. Now, if you enjoy the podcast and are a Facebook user, don't forget you can find the podcast's page there. I do try to post a few relevant things to the latest episode there. I'm not sure what we'll be looking at next time. It could be the German Blitzkrieg campaigns of 1940, but we'll see. Well, that's it for this episode. I'm Angus Wallace, and thanks for listening.